hate to break this wonderful spiritual atmosphere, but I want to tell you this story. I want to start by telling you the story about the cussing deacon. So this pastor had a deacon, and he was getting reports from different people in the congregation that this deacon had a problem, and he would just fire out some cuss words once in a while, and the pastor knew he had to deal with it. He had to do something with him. So he figured he'd bring him fishing. So he brought him out fishing, and he figured, you know, he'd wait for the right moment to kind of broach the subject and, you know, reprove him, rebuke him, just tell him, try to get him out of that, that habit. And, uh, but in the meantime, the pastor hooked onto this fish that was a monster, and he fought this fish, and it was awesome. And he's reeling this fish. He's got this beautiful fish right by the boat. And, and he went for the fish, and the, the hook came out, and the fish got away. And the pastor turned to the deacon and said, now would be an appropriate time to say something. <laughs> I want to talk to you about overcoming today. Not being overcome. You either overcome or you will be overcome. You either overcome or you will be overcome. You with me? I'm going to read two chapters to you in the Bible. I know it's a lot, but I want to tell the story here. It's in Numbers chapter 13 and 14. I'm going to read through it and make some comments as we go to illustrate what I'm talking about. The people had been delivered from Egypt from bondage and... They had been at Sinai, received the commandments, and now they're wandering. Not, they haven't been wandering too long in the desert, but they've been walking through the desert a little bit. And here's where the story starts in verse 1 of 13 at Numbers. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Send out for yourself men so that they may spy out the land of Canaan, which I am going to give to the sons of Israel. So they knew the Lord was going to give them this land. He said, it. I'm going to give you this land, but I'm sending, I want you to send some spies. You shall send a man from each of their father's tribes, every one a leader among them. So they chose certain people to be these spies. They were leaders among the people. So Moses sent them from the wilderness of Paran at the command of the Lord. All of them men who were heads of sons of Israel. So the Lord wanted them to see the land even though they were going to receive the land. When Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan, he said to them, go up into the Negev, then go up into the hill country and see what the land is like. Uh, make an evaluation. And whether the people who live in it are strong or weak, whether they are few or many, and how is the land in which they live? Is it good or bad? And how are the cities in which they live? Are they like open camps or with fortifications? And how is the land? Is it fat or lean? Are there trees in it or not? Make any effort, make an effort then to get some fruit of the land. Now the time was the time of the first ripe grapes. So they were really trying to figure out two questions. Is this going to be a good gift from God? Is the land going to be great or is it going to be crummy? And can we take it? Can we Get into this land. Is it even a possibility? Is it realistic for us to expect that? Now, that was the people's purpose of going. Is it good, and can we get it? God's purpose of them going is he wanted them to see the good and the bad and the blessing that he was about to do, the miracle he was about to give them. He wanted them to see that. It was a recon. What would, you, what would you do if God spoke to you today, I'm going to give you a big chunk of land? You'd be like, what? are there trees on it? I mean, where is it? What is it? Let me, let's go see it. You know, that's what you'd, you'd be like that. When am I going to get it? Is it really, um, can I really get it? What do I have to do to get it? That's what they were going through. When they had gone up, they came to he Hebron, where Heman, Shishai, and Talmai, the descendants of Anak, were. So the first thing they saw was the big and ugly. Then they came to the valley of Eskol, and from there cut down a branch with a single cluster of grapes, and they carried it on a pole between two men, this huge cluster of grapes, 
with some of the pomegranates and figs. The second thing they saw was the big and the beautiful. They saw the risk and they saw the reward of what God was doing. When they returned from spying out the land at the end of 40 days, so they had 40 days to look at this, to steep it in, they proceeded to come to Moses and Aaron and to the, all the congregation, and they brought back word to them and showed them the fruit of the land. Thus they told them and said, it certainly does flow with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Nevertheless, the people who live in the land are strong in the cities, fortified and very large. And moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. So they basically reported accurately, balanced what, what it was. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, we should by all means go up and take possession of it, for we shall surely overcome it. You see the faith in his heart. But the men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people, for they are too strong for us. You see the fear in their heart. So here we have a familiar inner conflict. Whenever God is moving us forward, moving our lives forward, we have this idea of faith and we have this idea of fear going on in us. Can I do it? Will I fail? We face it. Personally, we face, we face it as a church. We face it as a nation. So they gave out to the sons of Israel a bad report of the land, which they had spied out, saying, the land is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people whom we saw in it are men of great size. There also, we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak are part of the Nephilim, and we became like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in their sight. They sent leaders, and these leaders were now coming back and leading the people into fear and doubt instead of faith. And now we're on chapter 14. Then all the congregation lift up of their voices and cried. People follow leaders. They cried, and the people wept that night. That's just The people just reflected the leadership view. And all the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. And the whole congregation said to them, would that we have died in the land of Egypt or would that we have died in the wilderness? And why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? God's blessing now is seen as something bad, scary, hurtful. Our wives and our little ones will become plunder. Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? They're assuming failure. <laughs> Nothing's happened, but they're assuming failure. So they said to one another, let us appoint the leader and return to Egypt. Nothing's happened. The leaders have spoken and brought them into fear and doubt. They're crying. They're wailing. They're, they don't want to go. They want to have a little mutiny there. They're, oh, my wife's going to be ravaged. My kids are going to be taken as slaves. We want a new leader. And Moses and Caleb are sitting there like, wow. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces in the presence of all the assembly and the congregation of the sons of Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, of those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes. And they spoke to all the congregation of the sons of Israel, saying, the land which we pass through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. They were like, we're not giving this up. We're going to take another run at this. We got to tell the people. We got to exert some leadership. There was two and there were ten. Two in faith, ten in fear and doubt. If the Lord is pleased with us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord and do not fear the people of the land, for they shall be our prey. Their protection has been removed from them. And the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. Both the ten and the two saw the same thing. They saw the grapes. They saw the giants, the good land, the milk and honey kind of land. But two saw God as the answer. 
And they weren't going to fear. They weren't going to doubt. They weren't going to rebel. They were going to believe God. Verse 10, but all the congregation said to stone them with stones. They're just trying to believe God. And they all decided to stone. So extreme resistance. Then the glory of the Lord appeared in the tent of meeting to all the sons. Extreme resistance against God and an extreme presence of God. All in one mix. The, um, so we see this crescendoing up, this, this faith and fear on both sides. God was right there. God was ready to act. God was ready to move them into a great gift. But God needed faith. God wasn't going to move without faith. And the Lord said to Moses, how long will this people spurn me? And how long will they not believe in me despite all the signs which I've performed in their midst? With all they've seen, they should trust me by now. All those miracles in Egypt, all that has happened on Mount Sinai, I will smite them with pestilence and dispossess them, and I will make you into a nation greater and mightier than they. God's saying, I'm going to do a redo, just like back with Noah. I'm just tired. I'm just going to get rid of these guys. I'm going to start with you again. Um, because he couldn't work without faith. And they were not going to let God use these, use the people, move the people forward into the promise and into all he had for them. And so he couldn't do anything with them. I think what God's saying here is God is better off with one person with faith than a whole nation without faith. Just give me one person with faith versus a whole nation without faith because God needs faith to move us. Let me continue. But Moses said to the Lord, then the Egyptians will hear of it. Pardon, I pray, the iniquity of this people. So the Lord said, I've pardoned them according to your word. So God answered Moses' prayer to pardon. But indeed, as I live, surely all the men who have seen my glory and my signs, so in other words, they should know better, which I performed in Egypt and in the wilderness, yet have put me to the test these ten times and have not listened to my voice, shall by no means see the land which I swore to their fathers, nor shall any of those who spurned me see it. People didn't trust God. They didn't believe him. God was going to say, okay, I'm just going to take you out of the way. I'm going to dispossess you. But he allowed them to live. They got their way, but they were never going to go into the promised land. Because they were living in unbelief. They acted like were they were part of the people of God. But they, they were living amongst them. But they were acting in unbelief. They were not living by faith. We can do the same. We could live amongst people of God. But not have faith in God when he's moving us to move with them. And he'll put up with us. He'll still bless us. But will we make the promised land? But my servant Caleb, because he has had a different spirit and has followed me fully, I will bring into the land which he entered, and his descendants shall take possession of it. Your children, however, whom you said would become a prey, I will bring them in, and they shall know the land which you have rejected. So it's not the sins of the fathers visiting the children. The children were going to go into the promised land. The fathers were not for their sin. But it was kind of an ir irony. The, the people were saying, oh, I'm so, so scared to go into the land because we're going to become prey. They ended up becoming prey and dying in the wilderness because they didn't go ahead with, with God. And their children went in without them. They tried to save their own necks, but God just wanted them to believe in him. But as for you, your corpses shall fall in this wilderness, and your sons shall be shepherds for 40 years in the wilderness, and they shall suffer for your unfaithfulness. It's not, uh, God's not punishing for the sin of the father, but when a father's acting stupid, when there's, the, the parents are having, pro it, it, it affects the home. No, no problem no, no problem to understand that. According to the number of days which you spied out the land, 40 days, for every day you shall bear your guilt a year, even 40 years, and you shall know my, my opposition. 
And again, he still provided for them in the desert like he provides for us, but he wasn't going to let them go in the promised land because they weren't living by faith. I, the Lord, have spoken, surely this I will do to all this evil congregation who are gathered together against me. There's no neutral with God. They were either with him and ready to live by faith and go forward, or they were an evil congregation and they were not with him. No neutral with God. In this wilderness, they shall be destroyed and they shall die. As for the men whom Moses sent to spy out the land and who returned and made all the congregation grumble against him by bringing out a bad report concerning the land. So these are the leaders that led people in the wrong direction. Even those men who brought out the very bad report of the land died by a plague before the Lord. It's a greater responsibility. But Joshua, the son of Nun and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, remained alive out of those men who went to spy out the land. We always win by following the Lord. And when Moses spoke these words to all the sons of Israel, the people mourned greatly. In the morning, however, they rose up early and went up to the ridge of the hill country, saying, Here we are, we have indeed sinned, but we will go up to the place which the Lord has promised. So it was too late, but now they were trying. But Moses said, why then are you transgressing the commandment of the Lord when it will not succeed? Do not go up lest you be struck down before your enemies, for the Lord is not among you. For the Amalekites and the Canaanites will be there in front of you, and you will fall by the sword, inasmuch as you have turned back from following the Lord, and the Lord will not be with you. But they went up heedlessly to the ridge of the hill country. Neither the ark of the covenant of the Lord nor Moses left the camp. Then the Amalekites and the Canaanites who lived in that hill country, came down and struck them and beat them down as far as Hormah. Numbers chapters 13 and 14. Sometimes it has to be now with God. <laughs> some, some people like this expression, it's better to ask for forgiveness than permission. In other words, just go ahead and do it. You could ask for forgiveness, but not with, it doesn't, you know what's better? It's to live by faith to follow God at every turn, wherever he leads you, always. So I've entitled this Overcome or Be Overcome. These, these people were given a chance to overcome, but instead they were overcome. They died in the, in the wilderness. Some of them were beaten by the enemy. They tried to go up later. Some of them died immediately by the plague. Those were the leaders that gave a bad report, didn't have faith, and steered the whole congregation sideways. But all of them died in the wilderness during those 40 years. To think what was within their grasp. The leaders were sent out. They were expected to have faith. They were sent to look at the people, the land, the fortifications. What was it like? They got the grapes. They said, yeah, flows with milk and honey. But the people are strong, cities are fortified. It was a fair and balanced report. It was Fox News. You know. God sent them to see the benefits and the beauty and the difficulties and the dangers. Because life always comes at a price. There's plenty of great things in life that you can do. But there's some risks involved. And that's God's way. They say when you go into marriage, it's eyes wide open. After marriage, it's eyes half shut. That's the saying. There's risks, there's rewards. There's pluses, there's minuses. If there were always, uh, or if there were no positives, we would never go and want anything. If there were no negatives, we would just, it would be like no challenge. It would take no faith. Life's not about floating. Life is about fighting battles with faith. When we come against resistances to life, that we exercise faith in God. If it is in fact God's will for us, we fight for faith. We believe and we overcome. 
all of them saw the grapes and all of them saw the giants. And Caleb said, he was the first to speak, let's go. We shall surely overcome it. He saw it. He believed it. He trusted God was right on. And this is where it got ugly. The politicians came in. I, I don't know if you watch the politicians at all, but they're frustrating in Washington. You got one side that says something, the other side says the opposite. They're both saying it's true, and it doesn't make any sense. You know, so, so this political situation was it's a good land. God will do it, Caleb said. Then everybody else started, no, it's a bad land. Then they started exaggerating. We're grasshoppers in their eyes. They start exaggerating, kind of twisting the truth, all this to make their point. Of course, they had to do hand-to-hand -hand combat if they were going to battle. And that they were giants in there was a little intimidating. <laughs> but they grumbled. They doubted God. You know, our imagination is powerful, and it's amazing what fear and doubt can do to your mind. What fear and doubt can do to your life could do to a dream that you have. Before it even starts, they didn't even take one step forward toward the problem. There were no battle. There was nothing, and yet they were in this big upheaval. Nothing even happened yet. It was just Fear and doubt had come into their imagination and blew up their dream. Where's your lamb of milk and honey? What's your number one that you feel God is moving you toward and moving you into? Fear and doubt will douse your dream. The voice of faith and the voice of fear contend in our lives. Joshua and Caleb were confident that the other guys would be prey, not them. They were positive about the possibilities coming ahead, and the others weren't, and God was annoyed enough with them that he wanted to dispossess them. How long will they not believe in me, he said. A big part, the biggest part of overcoming in our lives, of being an overcomer, is faith. Faith that God will do what he says he's going to do. And that we act upon that faith. We go into the land, into the place, into the situation that God is calling us into. So as an overcomer, what are we overcoming? Well, first of all, we overcome obstacles. God wants to move us forward in our lives to better places. Life is dynamic. He's always moving us forward. He has a plan. He has a calling. He has a life for us, a destiny for us. He intends for us. But obstacles try to get in the way and prevent that. And any Bible story will tell you the same thing. Paul said, I press on in order that I may lay hold of that, which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. There's a purpose, and I'm going to lay hold of it, forgetting what lies behind those things that hold me down and obstacles to me, reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ, for God's will. Caleb and back in the desert and Paul, different life circumstances, but really it's all the same. They had to be overcomers to attain their destiny. And our lives are moving forward. And both of them had to press on and remain in the place God had for them as obstacles came. They had to keep overcoming the obstacle because obstacles because life keeps moving. Obstacles keep coming. It doesn't matter if you're old or young or you're an older Christian or younger. If you've done great things for God or you're just starting out on your walk with God. We're all under the same mandate to fulfill God's destiny to, for us, to fulfill his will for us. And there's going to be obstacles. And we have to overcome those obstacles. We have to press through the difficulties. And God helps us. Sometimes God does it all for us. Sometimes we do almost all of it. But, but he wants us to overcome the obstacles in our way, in our path. And maybe... The scriptures are speaking to you today 
and you feel like giving up on a dream or on a relationship, and you've got all the excuses in the world, but I want to remind you that you will either overcome or you will be overcome. You will either overcome or you will be overcome by other things. Overcoming is not out of our reach, but we must act. Johnny Fulton, I've been watching the Olympics and he brought up some stories. Johnny Fulton, run over by a car at age three, suffered crushed hips, broken ribs, a fractured skull, compound fractures in his leg. It didn't look as like that he would even live, but he wouldn't give up. Later, he ran the half mile in less than two minutes. Walt Davis was totally paralyzed by polio when he was nine years old, but he didn't give up. He became the Olympic high jump champion in 1952. Lou Gehrig was a clumsy ball player as a kid. Nobody wanted him on their team. They wouldn't let him play with him, but he was committed. He didn't give up. Eventually, he entered the Baseball's Hall of Fame. Woodrow Wilson couldn't read until he was 10 years old. But he was a committed person. He became the 28th president of the United States. In this little biography, at age seven, he had to go to work to help support his family. At nine, his mother died. At 22, he lost his job as a store clerk. At 23, he went into debt and became a partner in a small store. At 26, his partner died, leaving him a huge debt. At 35, he was defeated twice, running for a seat in Congress. At age 37, he won the election. At 39, he lost the re-election. At 41, um, his four-year-old son died. At 42, he was rejected for a land officer role. At 45, he ran for the Senate and lost. At 47, he was defeated for nomination for vice president. At 49, he ran for the Senate again and lost again. At age 51, he was elected uh, president of the United States, and you all know his name, uh, Ab Abraham Lincoln. When we're convinced it's God's will for us, it then becomes a matter of faith. If we'll believe and not fear. And God gets so annoyed, he will dispossess the people because they didn't believe. Moses had to intercede to help them. Believing God is always within our reach. Or we can push him away. We could say, try again later. We could let fear take root like it did for them. Listen, you hear a word from this pulpit. It may be true. You may need it, but you just push it away. I don't want to receive it. Or you may wait too long the end of the service. You can solidify that word that was preached, the word of God in your heart by coming to an altar and receiving prayer or just being with the Lord and settling it in your heart. Because if you just walk out and say, oh, I'll deal with it later. Yeah, that was for me, but yeah, I'll walk out there. Something funny happens on the way home. Things evaporate. They just kind of like they never happen. It's got to be hit at the altar. And you've got to turn fear to faith, to believe, to receive. Or it'll just, it'll just be like nothing. I know people through the years who have had tremendous difficulties. And I know that the message I preach has hit their heart exactly where they need to believe. They just walk out. They don't come to the altar. They don't, they don't get the faith to say, yes, I'm moving into this territory for me. You miss the opportunity, and God may not be there later like he wasn't for the Israelites in unique situations. The Israelites were not overcomers. They were overcome. It can happen because <laughs> they didn't act. When the grace of God was given and flowing, they waited. Paul acted. He was an overcomer. 
the way you miss God, the way you miss his promise, the way you miss going into the promised land to the next step is to just say, oh, yeah, whatever, push it away or wait too long or ignore it. Don't act upon it. God sent them into this spying expedition to see, yeah, how great God was. And at least if God is speaking something, a word to your heart from this pulpit, come to the altar on a spying expedition and at least check it out in the spirit. Is this God, God is this you speaking to me to do this? You see what I'm saying? But the biggest obstacle is often our own personal faith. It's the biggest obstacle. Young man dating a beautiful young woman, tempted. But he said, you know, I'm going to live for God. I'm going to be an overcomer. And he was an overcomer. Young woman, church-going woman, gets pregnant. Scared, what's the church going to say? But she's an overcomer. She says, I'm going to go back to church because that's where God wants me. And she finds she is loved and supported. God's way works. God wants us to have a, a, a beautiful life in, in his eyes here. Even after we've messed things up royally. Around the world, there are doors like those doors in hundreds of thousands of local churches. And people walk through those doors. Maybe they've, they're steeped in sin, bad habits ingrained in them, in their families, in their marriage, whatever, in their homes. Like a drowning man, maybe sometimes too proud to reach for the life buoy until he's so tired he can't hardly reach for it. But thank God Jesus keeps lifting. Jesus keeps calling. Jesus keeps reaching to us. Jesus keeps loving us. Don't wait till you're exhausted. Don't wait till you've broken everything in your life to come to an altar and believe that God has something better for us. Don't wait till you used up every possible human failure till you're at the brink of disaster. Come to the altars. Come to God. Meet him. Follow him by faith. Overcome the obstacles before they overcome you because they will. You can't be anything you want. I hate when these graduate graduation speakers say, you could be anything you want. That's just not true. You can do anything you want. No, that's not true. But you can be what God wants you to be, and you can be victorious in what God wants you to do. So, what are we overcoming? We're overcoming obstacles. Secondly, we're overcoming evil. The biggest battle is not out there. It's right here. The biggest battle for us to be overcomers is not all the situations and circumstances. It's right here. You know the Great Wall of China? Huge. Thick, high, long. You know, for the first hundred years that that was put up, three times armies got through. But they never came over the wall. It was too high. They never went around the wall. It was too long. They never went through the wall. It was too thick. You know what they did? They bribed the gatekeeper, and the armies just walked right in. It's not the height of the obstacle you're facing. It's the obstacle of faith in your heart right here. The devil wants to bribe you. <laughs> the world wants to talk you out of living for God and walking in God and fulfilling his desires for you. The battle the Israelites faced wasn't with the giants. It wasn't with the fortifications, although they thought it was. It was with their own hearts, and they lost before they ever started. They lost. What a, what a tragedy. They didn't even start, and they failed because it was their hearts. Not Paul. Paul got up and got going when he heard that calling. He won in his heart before he ever took a step forward. 
He was already there. And it wouldn't really matter if Paul started a couple of more churches or a couple of less churches. He already won because in his heart he was an overcomer. It's not the particular circumstances. It's not really even the battle you face right now, which you think is so important to you. It's your heart. Do you believe God? Do you trust him enough to say, okay, God, let's go. I believe you. That's what it's about. Paul was in, it doesn't matter if Paul was in prison or not. He was an overcomer. It doesn't matter with Jesus on the cross or not. He was an overcomer. We don't overcome because we get elected for something or we buy something big or we get some. We're an overcomer because we believe God, no matter the outcome. It's a crazy world. <laughs> God's watching our hearts. We may try some things for God and it may look like a failure just like the cross and just like the beating did. But, but God's watching and he says, you're an overcomer. Your marriage may look like a failure, but you, you love and you respect and you try. And God's watching your heart. And he says, those are overcomers. Not because they got this romance going. <laughs> but because they love and respect. Because they believe in me and they keep going. And on and on. Battles won in our heart. That's why altar prayer is so important when you're dealing with something, when you're dealing with an obstacle, because you've got to get it right in your heart. You've got to get the faith in your heart to say, yes, Lord, and you've won. doesn't matter the outcome. You've already won. Romans 12, 21 says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Overcome is in the second person singular imperative. He's talking to you personally. You. Don't be overcome with evil. Overcome evil. From God. I kind of paraphrase using some of the meanings. Don't let evil conquer you. You overcome. You conquer. You prevail. You come off victorious. Don't let bad stuff and evil things get the best of you prevail over you but you use good things kindness anything that is good and you prevail over evil so we've got these two weapons to choose when a giant comes at us we've got this weapon of evil and that weapon is fun it feels weighty and good and when we swing it we just feel good we've got this other weapon of goodness it's kind of kind of a bummer Good doesn't feel very good at all. So a giant comes walking up to you. Maybe it's at work. Maybe it's in your home. Maybe it's at school. And starts being rude to you and starts kicking you around the block and with verbally. And you got a choice of what you're going to pick up. And you say, you know, that, that, that weight, that sword right here of evil feels really good in my hand, man. I, this thing just feels like I'm going to let him have it. So boom, you let him have it. Verbally, right back at him, rude, unkind, just hit him. Ah, man, you know, I mean, I took some hits, but man, I got him good too. And the next time you see that giant, they're going to come back madder and bigger and better armed. Or you pick up the weapon of goodness, and you're like, oh, man, is this going to work? I don't know, it's kind of a light little thing here, you know, and the person comes at you just vicious, rude, telling you different things, and you pick up this thing and you swing. Hey, can I get you a cup of coffee? Man, that didn't feel good. That felt crummy, man. Being humble is not, doesn't feel good. But you notice the battle, like the battle, just the intensity drains out of it. And the next time you see the giant, there's no battle. You won. Cain and Abel, Cain didn't get this very well when he, in a jealous rage, killed his brother. The irony was that he wanted to be accepted by God. He was jealous because his brother was accepted by God. Do you see the deceit? We, 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 he, he's not following faith, God's ways. Where he would have been accepted, he followed his own anger, his own jealousy, his own carnal ways. And he, to get accepted by God, he kills it. It was ironic. Peter says, 
by what a man is overcome, by this he is enslaved. Cain had the option to go back to his former ways. He knew God. He knew the right way. But he corrupted in that moment because he was just enraged that he wasn't accepted by God. And he lost. Nobody starts out saying, I'm going to be a thief, I'm going to be an abuser, I'm going to be an alcoholic, I'm going to be an addict, I'm going to be nasty to everybody in my life. It just happens when you keep picking up the wrong sword and keep using evil, fight after fight after fight. And then that's what you know. That becomes your go-to. And so could good. But the people of the Israelites, God called them evil. He had a better place, a better life. He wanted to move them forward, and they wouldn't go. He called them evil. Evil wants to overcome you. You say, oh, I could pick up either sword any time. Don't kid yourself. You get older, it gets harder to switch swords. <laughs> Start now. Start now picking up the right sword. Insist on picking up the right sword because it gets hard. Because evil wants to overcome you. And believe me, the giants keep coming. The giants keep coming, they'll keep coming, they'll keep getting bigger, and and they'll know how to fight better uh, more and more. Watchman Nee tells a story in China of a Christian who had a big rice field. And it was on a mountain, so the rice fields were tiered, and he would work so hard pumping water up to his rice field so his rice would grow and not die. His neighbor just below him, however when he went away, would open up the gate and drain all that water into his fields. And the farmer was upset with this, and he went to his church and got some counsel, and they prayed about it. (coughs) And they decided the best course of action was for the farmer, and this is what he did. He went, and he first filled up the, the other farmer's field first. He esteemed him higher than himself. And then he filled up his own. Doesn't feel good, does it, that sword? That sword just feels a little like, no, this isn't going to work. But that other person, that Chinese person, came to the Lord. I want to be an overcomer. I'm not always a successful overcomer. I want to be. I want to overcome evil with good. Because if I don't overcome, I will be overcome. How, where do I start? Start by being born again. 1 John 5, 4 says, For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. It's no surprise that Jesus said, Why do you marvel that you must be born again? The way the power of God enters us so we can fight with the good sword is by being born from above, being born again, being born of God. And once we're born of God, we walk by faith. We overcome by continuing to believe in God. 1 John 5, 5 says, and who is the one who overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? The psalm says, faith is the victory that overcomes the world. You're an overcomer when you believe. Not just, oh yeah, he's the Lord. No, but follow him. Do his will. He'll take you through the mountains, over the mountains, through the valleys. He'll walk with you. overall truth here is that when we are born again and we walk by faith, we walk in victory. We are overcomers. You might be sitting there saying, oh, I just wish that were true. You don't understand my situation. I got such a huge situation. It doesn't matter what your situation is. If you sit there and say, you know what, I am going to believe that God is going to bring me through, that God is for me and not against me. I am going to go to this altar. and I'm not going to wait. I am going to pray, and I'm going to seek God and solidify that in my heart, and I'm going to go out there and believe and act upon it. You are an overcomer. Doesn't matter the outcome. However important it is to you, doesn't matter. 
It's that your faith in your heart, that you trust God is what God, that's the sweetness to God. He wants you to move forward. Medisa sings, whatever it is you may be going through, I know he's not going to let it get the best of you. You're an overcomer. Stay in the fight till the final round. You know the song I'm talking about? You're not going under. Because God is holding you right now. You might be down for a moment, feeling like it's hopeless. That's when he reminds you that you're an overcomer. You're an overcomer. Everybody's been down, hit the bottom, hit the ground. You're not alone. Just take a breath. Don't forget. Hang on to his promises. He wants you to know you're an overcomer. The same man, the great I am, the one who overcame death, is living inside of you. So just hold tight. Fix your eyes on the one who holds your life. There's nothing he can't do. He's telling you, you're an overcomer. You can be an overcomer. You can overcome obstacles in your path that you need to one by one. You can overcome evil with good. Start by being born again, and then you continue by living by faith and trusting God, and the victories will come. They won't always look like the victories we want, they might look like the cross, but they will be victories. If you're getting tired for the f- of the fight, I'll read you these words. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. How could Jesus say that? We got to do so much. We got to f- kill all the giants. We got to go. No, because it's right here is the victory. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my load is light. The people were overcome simply because they wouldn't believe him. They wouldn't follow him. They saw the giants bigger than God. We got a, we got a great big God to face. I'm going to have the worship team come. We have to meet the word of God with faith, not with fear. And if you received a word of God, the the word of God today, and I read a lot of it, meet it with faith in your heart. Decide to follow Christ. If If you're not, decide to walk by faith. Revelation says, and he who overcomes and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. He's saying, what I started, the works that I did in Jesus, if you will keep doing them, and the things, the evil of this world and the obstacles around you as they try to stop you from doing the will of God, if you will keep going and overcome those obstacles, you're an overcomer. It's only by faith. And then we get to the milk and honey dream of God's for us. So I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you. Paul, Paul has a prayer. He prayed for the Thessalonians. We pray God may fulfill every desire for goodness and the work of faith with power. I want to pray that over you today. We're running a little late. Are you okay? Can we... Uh, I'm just going to have you come to the altar if you'd like to come. And I want to pray over you here to be an overcomer. To overcome and not be overcome by the obstacles and evils of this world. you to take this word in your heart and come and stand at an altar and just say yes okay Lord and solidify it by prayer solidify it by prayer thank you Lord he's a good God and he's with us Lord, we want to move into everything you have for us today. Help us to move, Lord God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Lord. 
We, we, we don't want to allow anything to overcome us. We want to be overcomers. And we want to solidify that in prayer. We don't want to walk out the doors and loosely, oh, I think, what, did, what was that? I want you to grab on to a certain point that you caught today that was important to you and bring it to the altar and settle it with God there and say, yes, God, this is your truth. God has great opportunities for you. You are peace, you are peace. When my fear is crippling, you are true, you are true. He wants beauty Even in our lives. In my he wants our lives full. You are joy, you are He's joy. created us You're with a plan in mind. Would you just look for God's opportunities you right now? In you, death has Just lost ask it. its sting. What's ahead, God? With every plan, with every opportunity, comes challenges, comes risk. But we want to walk by faith and not by fear. More important than the actual situation is your heart right now. Is it filled with faith in God? Do you believe? More than anything else, do you trust God? You must overcome or you will be overcome. You must overcome and follow God. No matter what you think or I think, or we'll be overcome. It's a personal decision, and faith is the victory. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Oh, God. I pray faith over this congregation, Lord. Solidified in prayer, Lord. Jesus. Lord, we pray God may fulfill every desire for goodness and the work of faith with power. Lord, that you will fulfill every desire that is a good desire. And the work of faith, the things that we are stepping into because of faith, that you would give us the power to step into them, Lord God. Right now, I pray faith across the congregation and across this altar for obstacles and for evil, situations and circumstances, fortifications and people, Lord God, that, Lord, we put them in your hands. We let you worry about them. Lord, we're going to be concerned about faith in our hearts today. Fill our hearts with faith. We open our hearts to believe you and to trust you. No matter what, Lord God, I thank you, Lord. And I know you'll bring us into that promised place, that promised land. We will, we will fulfill our destiny, Lord God. And I pray your blessing over that. <coughs> I'm going to let Kathy sing a little more. I want to pray for some of you individually. And then I'll come back and dismiss in just a moment. But let faith arise in your heart. I'll be back to dismiss in just a moment. My heart will 
Jesus, Jesus, my heart will sing no other name. Jesus, Jesus, my heart will sing no other name. Jesus, Jesus. nothing good in me. You are love, you are love on display for all to see. You are light, you are light when the darkness closes in. You are hope, you are hope. You have covered all my sin. Jesus, Jesus. It may not feel so powerful, it may not feel so great to wield the sword, the overcoming sword of goodness, but it wins. It wins the battles because it pleases God. Father, bless your congregation that we would walk by faith and we would know we are overcomers because we overcome first in our heart. Whatever situation is out there, whatever giant we're going to face off, this week with Lord God. We've already won because we're leaving here filled with faith in our hearts, Lord God. And you have made us overcomers because we will believe you, Lord God. I thank you, Lord. May you, rest, may you rest your blessing upon us. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you.